right. Hey, we are live. Hi, everybody. I'm Maria Brophy, and I brought my new bestie here, <laughs> Ronnie Walter, Miss Artist, Author, Art Licensing Expert. What else can I say about you? Um, you know, and she's fun and funny. And she, you know, how you have somebody in your people in your life that like bring out certain things in you you always like bring out my silliness so and i appreciate that because usually i'm kind of serious and i try not to be so well, um, i like to bring the fun <laughs> i like to bring the fun <laughs> and you do you bring that vibe so um so what we're talking about today is ronnie what are we talking about today we are talking about how to determine if your art is right for licensed products and which licensed products you'd be most likely aligned with. Perfect. And I want to invite everybody, if you're on here live with us, ask questions. We will put your questions up. We will answer them as best as we can. And this is a great opportunity for you to talk to Ronnie, who has been in the art licensing world for over 20 years, right? Well over 20 yeah. years? Yeah, a long I've, time, a long I've time. I've been about 20 years, so between the two of us, <laughs> you're getting a lot of good info. <laughs> it's and, a brain um, trust, it's a brain trust between the yeah. two of us, yes. Yes, and um, what else I would say? Oh, and if you're listening to the replay of this after it's posted, ask questions in the comments and I pop in and answer them. So, you know, either way, we want questions and comments and hey, if you have a compliment for us, we'll take that too, right? Totally, totally. Okay, all right, you wanna take it away, Ronnie? Sure, sure. Okay. So as Maria said, I um, have, I'm an artist, an author. I coach artists. I also wrote a book about licensing and um, I've just been around this business for a long time. And I was also an agent. My husband, Jim, and I had an agency, an art licensing agency for 13 years. So I have looked at a lot of portfolios between and actually before that I was an art director at a stationary company. So even then I looked at a lot of portfolio. So I have sort of studied the art of the portfolio for a long time and just seen a lot of them. And um, so uh, I kind of have a, a perspective on this that um, is is honed by basically on the streets of art licensing. <laughs> so today I want to talk about three ways that you can evaluate whether your artwork is right for licensing or not. Or what parts of licensing that you want to explore and what parts you can leave behind because that's as important as anything. Um, as Maria and I have discussed a lot, there's so much information and we're uh, our, our job is just to try to keep it as concise as possible, but we often go across on tangents. So just be aware. Um, but basically today I wanna to talk about the three things that you can use to hone this answer for yourself. Okay. The first thing is recognizing that not all art, incredibly beautiful, wonderful art, isn't always appropriate for licensing. Also, there's incredible, wonderful art that that artist doesn't want to be in licensing. It is a method of monetizing your work. It is not essential and it's not necessarily right for you at any given point in your career. You might decide like, yeah, it's not really for me right now, which is fine. But it's good to know that going in as opposed to getting into the quagmire of it and going, oh, I don't want this. So we, we want to control this information as much as possible so you can make a good decision. Okay, so the first thing is to recognize that and to be reasonable and honest about what you want and what you think your art would work on as far as product goes. Because it's just not going to be for, you know, I swear the final words when I finally tip over will be, it's not for everyone. <laughs> your work is not for everyone. There is a subset of human beings that your work would be right for, but it's not for everyone. And it's the same with licensing. Your work is not for every product in every store on every substrate there is known to humankind to put your art on. It just doesn't work that way. So you need to look at, be very honest when you look at the work that you produce, the kind of work that you want to do, the kind of work that fills your soul, whether or not you ever see things like that on products. 
and if you even want to see things like that on products. So you have to be very honest because people will say things to you like, you should license your work. And you're like, really? Should I? I don't know. Should I? Or they tell you you should be on certain products. You should be on greeting cards. And you're like, do I? Mm, I don't know. And so you have to be really honest about the kinds of things you want to see your art on and the kinds of things that would just you just don't want to do at all. Okay. Do you, uh, I have a question for you. Yes. Did you ever put your art on a product and then regret it? Like if you ever had a situation or do you know, like, do you have an example? Um, for personally, I have, I have had things that went on um, products that I wasn't happy with the quality of them yeah. for sure. Where I'm like, eh. I don't think I'll show that one, <laughs> but, um, but you don't always know that going in and you don't really sometimes have a choice by the end, but you just don't put it on Instagram. Um, right. But there, the, I don't think there's ever been a time where I, I mean, there's certainly where I'm like, that is just not for me. Like, uh, like, well, there's just some categories that just weren't right for me because of the style of my artwork. But um Generally, the work I was doing when I was actively doing a lot of sort of general licensing was very commodity type artwork. It went on gift bags and gift wrap and those kinds of products. So there wasn't a big emotional component in them necessarily. Um, so I would say for me personally, no, but I've certainly seen artists like I, I remember talking to a guy at one of the trade shows and he was an incredible artist. And I said, could you stand to have this on a coffee cup? And he's like, no. And I'm like, well, yeah, then don't. <laughs> yeah. Then you should not. You should not. And there's variations on that answer also because some art, um, the if, if you are at a certain level in your career or you're aiming to be at a certain level, like say a gallery caliber artist, you want to make sure that you are not compromising. Yeah that artwork by putting it on a product that is either at a le level of retail that doesn't really match this high-end gallery or right. will tick off your collectors when they go, wait a minute, right. I spent how much for this painting and I can buy this thing at Walmart? Eh. You know, you so yeah. everything has to be balanced based on sort of this big picture, which is why this business can get a little bit complicated. It can yeah, and complicated. it's... It's also why you get so many different opinions because people who are in that high end art world, uh, some of them really look down on art licensing. And, um, you know, and to me, I think they're, you know, they're just not looking at it in the right way. I remember one of our first really official art licensing deals was back, gosh, this was like 2002. Um, with Whammo for boogie boards for Drew's art. And I remember we were, we had this great opportunity to do this, do a whole line of Drew Brophy boogie boards. And we questioned it and we were like, is this going to hurt Drew's brand? And that was when we didn't, you know, we were just babies. We didn't know what we were doing. And we had a, somebody, well meaning person, advise against doing it. But then, we really thought about it and we thought, okay, what is it that Drew is trying to do with his art? He wants to make people happy. He's not selling $50,000 paintings. He, back then he was selling $500 paintings and, and $100 paintings. And he wasn't really in galleries or anything. And we thought, well, if making kids happy with your art on boogie boards is that's not a bad thing if your goal is to make people happy with your art. So that was right. what helped us make that decision. However, and you know, the other thing is, is a product like that is sort of a gateway product. Yeah. They love this look. They love, I have this Drew Brophy thing and, oh, now I'm going to buy this and they'll move up that scale. But that is a, that is a sophisticated decision to make. And sometimes you can't anticipate that that's the way it might happen. Um, or, it could kill your brand. And we've certainly seen people, we used to say, Walmart's your last stop. You know, you'd say, right. like, yeah, you'd I, say would, I would never forever and make a bunch of money. But if you yeah. are, if you are at some level and you decide to do something, then you're that, that you now become, you're, you're at a new level of retail and retail does have a hierarchy. Yes. Um, 
it's a little more sheer than it used to be. It used to be very clear. Like 20 years ago, it was very clear where this hierarchy is, but that has changed. The democratization of retail has changed that, but there is still a stigma. You're probably not going to coexist in anthropology and Walmart at the same time. So, so you have to be honest about that. Is this where you want your art to be? And that that's a big decision. That's a big decision, no matter what other people are telling you. Um, there's, the second part of that is um, you want to look at the most, you're, you're kind of looking at the low hanging fruit at the beginning. So you, you evaluate your art, you're okay with going down this road. And then you say, so what are the most obvious products? So that's a good way to decide sort of where to start. What is your, what is your starting point? What's, what's the most obvious? What have other people done with your, in your style family that um, that you were okay with, that you liked, that you thought was a good product. And so you start with those obvious low hanging fruits. If you do super detailed pictorial artwork, like sort of that folk art kind of look or something, obviously jigsaw puzzles, you know, things like that. So you look at like, and, and we talked about this in our last live. If you didn't see it, go watch that because it's really good. Where you start to limit the scope of what your art, the, the job that your art can do, and then you focus on those categories. And so that's where you want to stay focused in the beginning of not seeing this wide, wide menu of choices for yourself. That's why, you know, when they hand you the 14 page menu, you're like, can I, can I just have a grilled cheese? Just, I'll have a grilled cheese. <laughs> I can't decide. So limit your menu down to the most obvious things, and then you can always work out from there. Um, but don't kid yourself. It, it won't go on everything. It won't go on everything. And you also have to think about, if you are doing like really detailed pictorial illustrations, you know, you think about well, what can they go on? I mean, like, are you going to put it on a keychain that's one by one inch? No, you know, it doesn't showcase the art. It doesn't serve you at all. It 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 doesn't. Um, it doesn't normally work. So look at the most obvious low hanging fruit, and concentrate on that, and then you can work the edges of that as you move forward. That is great advice. Let's take a question from Heather okay, sure. Johnson. Should you listen if people are telling you to put your art on certain things? Um, that actually is point number three. <laughs> okay. So we're going to get to that. That's yes. good. All right. Yes. Hang on to that, <laughs> Heather. And Hey, let's Possibly. just say hello to yeah. a few people that are here. Hi. Chelsea Porter. Hi, Chelsea. Hi, Armed Cadaver Illustrates. It's so funny. I always, sometimes I butcher these, uh, insta these, uh, names here. Okay. Hi, Kim. Kim. Hello, Kim. All right. Um, Okay, you want to go on to, are you ready to go on to point number yes. two? Yes. So point number two is, um, I touched on this a little bit, is research is your friend. And so the a really good obvious spot to go is to research other artists in your style family. And when I say a style family, you know, there are people that do super cute, cute, cute. There are people that do very, um, like I said, like highly illustrated pictorial scenes, things like that. You might be fantasy artists, you might be um, a surf artist, you know, you look at other people and then start looking at, okay, so they have chosen to license. What, and it can help you look at those obvious products by looking at people that are already doing stuff. Not that you're going to mimic them, but you'll start to understand like how manufacturers make a decision and how they look at, you know, the, the just the obvious products. Um, the other thing about that is um, you can start to see the categories. And so when you see the categories, you can identify both, you know, what they are and also how they're designed. And so sometimes I see when I've looked at thousands of portfolios that people take their art and they think they need to do a million mocks up mock-ups on things and all they do is go well here's my art and I cut a circle out of it and now it's a plate it's like no that's not a plate that's a circle of pattern that I can see over here as a square so the design part comes into it so that's part of your research too to see how a licensing collection is developed is developed the other thing is when you're doing this kind of research is that both consumers 
and retailers and retailers are you know the end result of the manufacturers but manufacturers consumers the general consumer and retailers take very small steps in new directions they don't make giant leaps they don't go from sweet puppies over to some goth dark heavy graffiti type art they take small steps in that direction or they soften that direction so that it balances what they already have and so when you are doing your research you are looking at if you're looking at manufacturers like people that make coffee mugs or puzzles you kind of get a general sense of their aesthetic of their customer base and you and you would eliminate people that you are just so far out stylistically from um, but then you look at people that, I mean, there are licensed things that are sort of outside the mainstream look that have um, successful licenses or licensing programs. And so you have to, then you can look at, so what kind of people are they? Who are, who are those people that license work that looks like this, as opposed to trying to get into this uh, mainstream look with something that is so not mainstream? So that is your research piece of this thing, is to really start to understand that. But do not underestimate how slow these trends move. We think they move fast, but in the big, I mean, we used, when we were, when we had our agency and we met all the time with manufacturers you know they were like well we want something like this but not this we want something this but newer than that but not it's like two steps and even one step but not anything big and so it's a much slower pace than you would think even though it looks fast to us it's a slower uh churn of looks than uh we would think do you so remember you the do you remember the owl trend Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it was years. This owl trend. When, I wonder when that finally died or is it still going? I don't even know. Well, I think there's always, I think that there's, I mean, certain, certain categories will keep a trend because then it becomes a classic. You know, it sort of yeah. transcends that everybody wants an owl and people would come to your booth at Surtex and say, hey, can I see all the owls that you have? And now it's like, it turns into just sort of a commodity item. Same with like llamas or sloths or whatever the um, animal du jour is. But yeah, they, they, they do tend to, to turn those trends, but then they become part of the conversation. They still stay in the line. It's, it's weird. It's weird. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna, if, if you don't mind, I'm gonna bring up a couple things here. Um, sure. The, uh, Mara asked this question, show some portfolio samples and portfolios or ideal portfolios. And I'm glad you asked this question because Ronnie and I are teaching an art licensing two course. And um, you can sign up by clicking the link in the description of this video. And Ronnie is going to go into detail in that. And Ronnie, in the course, will you be showing sample portfolios? Or examples? Um, yes, Ex simple examples, yeah. Okay, Yeah. perfect. All right, that's all I wanted to know. So sign up for the course if you guys wanna like d dive deep into getting your next license deal, preparing for it with your portfolio, reaching out to people, what to send them, what to say to them, the whole thing. We are gonna like hold your hands and like take you from start to finish, to the finish line. Totally. Okay. Let uh, let's say hi to Kim, because I like her little smiley face. Hi, Kim. Hi, Kim. Okay. Armed Cadaver said, haha, this reminds me of how I'll love some themes and artwork they have on stuff at Target one year and the next. Not so much. I'm wondering where last year's artist is at. I think some, some of those artists, they're like just changing with the trends constantly, right? Totally. Totally. And, you know, that is a... That is a um, armed cadaver that is a um retail is is like that particularly target target is so focused on we're doing this now we're done we're doing this now we're done and yeah and and i have known at least two artists that um believed that their deal with target was the holy grail until it wasn't 
and then no one wanted to touch them. It's that whole thing where they're really? like, they had, they, they had a very, uh, it was um, a lovely line. It was really nice. They had done it independently for years. They manufactured. Target came in and it was, I mean, they, they made a bucket of money. I mean, it's not like they're now, you know, living in their car or anything. Um, but they, um, but once that was done, they were done because they had built this business with independent retailers and the independent oh. retailers were like, you're, you're done. Uh Oh yeah. Am I still there? Okay. Yeah. You're still here. No, I got a, I got a circly deal. You got um, I so see anyway, you fine. Hopefully yeah. everybody else can see you Le leave us a comment. If um, you're, you know, let us know how the internet connection is for you guys on the other side. Here's a question from Jessica. Can artwork I've already sold prints of be considered for licensing? This is a good question. Um, I think yes. Yeah, I think absolutely. Yes. Because it's, it's almost like you've licensed it to yourself. You've given yourself that category. So if someone comes to you and says, um, we want to do prints, you can say, well, I do prints. And they can either say, Oh, well, if you already do prints, then we're not interested in prints. Thanks so much. Or they'll say, well, we'll give you a whole bunch more money to do prints. And you go, I'm out of the print business. Or they don't care because if you, the beauty of that, if you are selling a bunch of them, is you can say to them, if it's not a print person, or even if it is, you can say, well, I've sold X amount of these. And they go, oh, wow. So you already have an audience. And so it's not necessarily a, that is not necessarily a problem unless somebody is, you know, want it. Sometimes people want exclusive, exclusive, but generally in this climate, that isn't a problem. It's just situational. I find that the more the, the world sees your art, whether it's on prints or coffee mugs or whatever, it sells the other products that that art's on because people like to buy what they're, what's familiar to them. And totally. so, it, it goes back really, to that slow, that slow movement. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Okay, here's a good Don't question. Don't worry about it, Jessica. Here's a good question from Debbie. How do you learn what the trends are if you wanted to chase them? I, I actually would like to know your answer to that question. Um, well, being aware, being totally aware, um, looking outside your normal purview of your life. I always I think about cultural shifts. I mean, you have to be looking more than just the visual icons that you're seeing, but cultural shifts. We are, we are the, in the United States, the last year has been a lot of cultural shifts, a lot of eye opening on things that we care about and decided we don't care about anymore. And so how do you respond to those things in either imagery or product? So you look at bigger pictures. If you want to chase trends like straight down the road, then there are you can um, subscribe and pay for trend predictions, trend boards, um, and people that are um, looking at color two years ahead and looking at. Uh, it used to be again there used to be this hierarchy of trends that that happened, but now again that has gotten. Um, more democratized, if you will. Um, we all get to see the same things at the same time, whereas uh, 20 years ago, we didn't. And so I would say you just have to be hyper aware of what's happening. It's it's a fine line of chasing a trend and mimicking what's already there. You, you have to find a way to put your spin on it or put a fresh take on it that people go, oh, okay, that's cool. Like I get where she came from and now I get where she went with that. So, yeah. um, yeah. And, you know, just, just, a, an opinion, sometimes you got to pay for stuff. Right. <laughs> it, we're in a business. Most people don't expect to not have expenses in their business. And if, and if you want to know more about trends then signing up for some of the, the paid newsletters are probably in your um, best interest because you can move faster. Awesome. Off the top of your head, is there like a website that you can go to that you would recommend that you can sign up for? Uh, not off the top of my head. But just I'm like not. Google Trends um, new Newsletter or something like that? Yeah. You just know, Google is your things, friend. Google is always your friend. But, you know, the thing is that it's a lot of trends still happen from high-end fashion. Yeah. Um, if you look at patterns and um, 
looks. And of course, they're going to be way over the top. And people post them on Facebook like, can you believe what they would think we're going to wear? They never think we're going to wear that. But you can start to extrapolate. Um, oh, there's a lot of texture. Oh, there's a lot of um, bright florals. There's a lot of black backgrounds. You know, whatever those things are that you start to connect. It's always connecting dots. And that's what true trend people are doing. And that's what we all have to do on a daily basis. Yeah. By the way, Mara says we both look great. Thank you. Any any compliments is going to make it to the board. So you know, keep them coming. <laughs> if you want to get on the board, give us compliments. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I don't know I'm what just... it is about owls. For one thing, artists like to draw owls. I think that's part of it because there's lots of pattern and you can do cute things. You make your eyes flowers. Thank you know, hey I, guys. Mean, I think yeah, we and they're sort of feminine. And I think little girls like owls. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure what the connection is, but I think there is they do transcend a lot of stuff. They're cute. Right now. They're cute. All right, this is a good question. If you have a pattern on a site like Spoonflower, can you also license it? I would say yes. I don't think Spoonflower has a, an exclusive agreement. So yeah, no, why not? I don't think so. But you should know that. You should know that. They they may for fabric or depending on what um, products you're putting it on. But again, that should not, again, it's like you're licensing it to yourself. So if you pick a category and you go, I'm going to be go big on Spoonflower, then maybe you're out of the fabric licensing biz for now until you, if you build that business, then you can go, Hey, journal people, I have all these patterns that um, have sold like crazy on Spoonflower. So that can work in your favor. Yeah. Yeah. We have we have a really active group today. There are so many amazing questions. And um, gosh, I'm trying to think. I mean, if you want to look through, I, I don't know that we'll be able to answer all these questions because you haven't even gotten to your third point yet. Ronnie, you're in charge. Do you want to get to your third point and then kind of pick and choose? Sure. Questions? I just saw all the I've just saw all the questions. That's a lot of questions. So I'm just getting my yeah. third point is very simple. And that is let your art guide you. Your your art will answer some of the questions. So this is where it comes up when people, when um, I forget who asked the question about, um, should you pay attention when people tell you what your art should be on or yeah. something along those lines? Um, you know, you hear this a lot. You should be on greeting cards. Have you ever thought of doing a calendar? Blah, blah, blah. You know, they say you should license your art. Um, that is a, pay attention to that. They may not be right. They may not be right. Um, but, Pay attention. If you start hearing that a lot, like, oh, I would totally buy that on a tote bag if they can't afford the painting, if you're at a, at a um, show or something like that. And then you have to decide, is that something you want to do yourself or is that something you want to find a license for? But that, though, anytime someone tells you something like that, that should be put into the hopper and digested and decided if that's something that makes sense for you and your artwork. So, yes. Um, think of those things and because people do make out offhanded comments you're like yeah that is a good idea um but they might say oh that is so great that would be so great on a greeting card and then you look at it and think yeah i don't see that but that's okay you're allowed to do that but when i talk about letting your art be the guide to how you sort of hone in on products is think about who likes your art who is that eventual consumer that likes the kind of artwork that you do. So if you do very um, nature oriented or wildlife, um, really um, outdoorsy kinds of looks, think about people that like outdoorsy kinds of looks and think about what they do. What else do they do? They might hike, they canoe, they commune with nature, they do different things outside. So what would be those products that they would say, oh, well, I'd love to have a water bottle with that, or I can see a t-shirt with that on it, or a sticker. Seems like outdoor people really love their stickers. They and do. So, yeah. <laughs> they do, they're on everything. And, and stickers, so, there's a lot of money in stickers. You, you'd be surprised. Stickers are good, stickers are good. I have a little collection of stickers. And actually my first license were stickers. I well, designed so cool. many stickers. Um, but anyway, so you look at, the first thing is, who likes my artwork? And what else do they do? And what else do they buy? And then you start to hone that in. So if you have artwork that's 
on the sort of spiritual side, whether that's scripture based or more of a new age thing, what do those people that buy are attracted to spiritual type artwork, what do they use in their daily life? And those are your most obvious, those are your low hanging fruit type products. So if it is like a spirituality thing, journals, candles, yeah. yoga mats, yeah. wall art, small pieces of art, that kind of thing where you can start to see like, oh, I'm gonna build a little Zen gallery kind of thing. So you start to hone in on what kind of art do I do? Who likes that? And what do those people do? And that's how you can get really closer to finding those core products that you can start with, that, that you can start bringing your work to manufacturers around because you can talk about that. You can talk about that. Yeah. So that was my awesome. that was my final point. I mean, same same thing. It's like new moms. You have really cool hip kind of patterns or uh, juvenile patterns. It's like new moms. They want things that either are nursery decor or things that make life easier. Um, they might they're they're totally into gift wrapping bags because they're having babies. All their friends are having babies, and so you can get in. You can identify products based on who that person is. You, it's not about you. It's not about your art and wanting it to be licensed. It's about yeah. who would buy the stuff with your stuff on it. And that's how you like get closer to understanding where you should start and identify products that work for your artwork. Perfect. Beautifully so. said. And I just want to remind everybody that Ronnie and I are teaching a very in-depth course on art licensing. Click the link. It's called Art Licensing 2. And if you want an overview, there's also Art Licensing 1. And both of those links are in the description. And I would love to see you in the course. We're teaching it live and then it will be available as a replay after the live. And you will always have access to it. Just click the link and read more about it. Um, do you want to um, choose some questions to answer? I think some of these questions, so many questions, by the way, you guys, thank you for the great questions. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I think fantastic. some of these questions have already been answered. Um, here's a compliment for you because, you know, compliments always make it to the screen. <laughs> Ronnie, Aww, you've always Jen, the thank you. Insight. Thank you. I miss your face too, Jen. Um, it says, uh, Beverly says, I have a fabulous niche audience that constantly reaches out to license my work, but typically doesn't want to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's How not turn cool. turn an enthusiastic potential customer into a paying one? Um, uh, I would, I would, yeah, that's, a, uh, well, first of all, I would say if one person likes it and they're a cheapskate, more than likely, there's another manufacturer that is not a cheapskate <laughs> that you could research and find out. Um, yeah. Um, are you talking about just just to dive a little deeper? In that are you talking about like the the audience members are saying, "I want you to license your art, but I don't want to pay for it," like on a print on demand situation, or are you talking about a manufacturer that's reaching out to you? Yeah, Just give us more, more detail on this, Beverly, because Ronnie, yeah. one thing I notice about you, you like to solve problems. Yes, you I do. Want, <laughs> yeah, like you want to give her a solution, but you need more information. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so we'll, let's see, Beverly, let's see, she answered, this happens all of the time, yoga studios. Mm. Well, um, yoga studios. Hmm. Well, I guess they, yeah. So they are so small, they're not going to have money. But here, I have a solution for you. If if your art does really has a lot of interest from those types of people, yoga studio people who are into, um, you know, that sort of thing, go to the companies that sell products to the yoga studios, right, Ronnie? Because yep. those companies. So instead of working directly with the yoga studios, because they, I mean, some yoga studios do make a lot of money, but some of them are really small, right? They don't have that much money to pay in licensing. They probably don't do a lot, like huge volume and sales, but they, if they have a gift store, which most yoga studios do, they have like a gift, gift store area. They are buying product from manufacturers 
find out who makes those products that right. they buy and go to those manufacturers. Right. Totally. Because yeah, and, and and it won't be their exclusive product, but if they love it and you're hitting um, a nerve with them, then you can say, oh, you can buy them from XYZ Yoga Mat Company. They now have the exclusive license and you can buy them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's the, that's the only way you can do it because yeah, they can't buy enough product for you to make any money um, for whatever that product is. They just can't. Even even the best yoga studio in town, they're only going to stock how many of one thing? Twenty five. So you can't yeah. make money that way. Right. No. Uh, or you could offer them something else. Like I understand you love this design why don't we try out some prints or something like that that you could make and hang there and they could buy them as opposed to something that's more expensive that they have to manufacture that you could switch that into more of a, a gallery situation for yourself if you want to yeah here i just want to bring up andrea pro she said she can't wait for art licensing two she took the first class so we will see you in art licensing two andrea Yay. And um, okay, so any other questions that Garben, I just want to say hello to my buddy Gar ben Benedict, who is in Laguna Beach. Hi, Gar, good to see you. Cons to licensing, name the top three cons to licensing, Ronnie. Top three. Um, well, um, devaluing your art, if you, um, you have to be very conscious of that. Um, things that make your eye twitch, products that you don't like, feeling like you didn't get the deal that you wanted. I, I try to avoid all things that make my eye twitch. And so uh, that is often my barometer, if you will, on a deal or not. It's like, oh, look, my eye's twitching. And so um, those would be the two off the top of my head. And also feeling like once it's done, it's done. You know, uh, licenses don't last as long as they used to. And so sometimes you've just, you've, the, the longevity is not there and it just is. But if you made money along the way, you just go, well, that's the way this business works. Do you have yeah. three top ones? Um, well, I, so I made a banner out of this because I liked what you said. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best advice ever. Avoid deals and make your eyes twitch. Well, and that kind of goes along with, so my, my, I don't see a downside to licensing unless you sign a bad contract, a deal that makes your eyes twitch or something that makes your stomach hurt. In my case, it's if I feel icky about it and I really listen to my body, I listen to my intuition. If something feels icky, I won't do it. I won't do it. I won't jump into it. Um, but I, you know, I, I try to think of all the, I mean, we, I've put together probably hundreds of licensing deals. Um, most of them really small, like small, you know, for like a local guy selling t-shirts and we put Drew's art on it and we got paid like a small flat fee. You know, that, that's a lot of the licensing we've done or like a skateboard line, which there's not a whole lot of money in skateboards. Um, unless you go with a really big company, but most of the skateboard companies are small. Um, but when I think back on all the deals, I don't have, I don't regret anything. I mean, there was, there was one deal we did with a guy, um, a, a company out of Florida, and it's a Brazilian family. Um, and there was a cultural, you know, sometimes you're dealing with other cultures and some cultures kind of, uh, and I'm not saying this about the Brazilian culture. It was more about the man. So a certain age group of men from different countries kind of look at, you know, that they don't respect women as much as like maybe they should. Boy, am I stepping into something here? Anyway, <laughs> go on. <laughs> all right, oh, do I'm going to narrow it down. This one man was a misogynist. Okay, right, and right. And, um, and it was a great deal that we had, like the, the whole, the products, everything was great, but I'm the one who does all the contracts and negotiating. And he, I remember he just spoke down to me all the time mm. and I'm a strong woman. I don't normally let things like that bother me, but he really wore me down one, one day. I just 
cried my eyes out because he, he screamed at me on the phone and like it stressed me out so bad that I got off the phone and I and that's how I released all that stress was by crying and I thought I never cry like I didn't cry when my grandmother died and this man made me cry and what came from that I thank this man now because I learned that there is a certain personality type that bullies people. And if you don't respond properly, you will be a victim, right? So what I learned was that when you meet that personality type in business or anywhere, you have to be extremely strong and say, I do not tolerate this. This is how things are going to go. And when this happened many, many, many years ago, I was younger and very a lot shy. I was kind of shy. It made me build a backbone. Mm -hmm. And I stood up to this man like my next conversation with him was the way you treated me. I'm never going to tolerate that again. And if we are going to continue in this business relationship, we are equals. I am not this little lady that belongs in the kitchen. We are business equals. And surprisingly, this man said, okay, I respect that. And you know, he never spoke down to me again. Wow. And we worked Good together for, for several more years and he respected me after that. Wow. Well, good for you. And sometimes you do have to take control of the situation. Yeah. And just for everyone watching, most deals do not end in tears. <laughs> most <laughs> well, that's not. why this one stands out not. of hundreds. This one, there have been you know. tears shed, but it's, it's, it's very rare. It's very rare. Um, but sometimes you do have to, you know, like the old, you have to teach some people how to treat you. And um, yeah. I do find that, um, most of the people that I have had dealings with and we've had licenses with are very reasonable human beings. They, they, most people are just fine. Um, you know, there is always a negotiation. There's a little back and forth, but it's never, there's not animosity. There's not animosity. And you know, they're, they're, they're the jerks you could count on one hand. So more than likely you won't, won't run into a jerk or you do what Maria did and teach them a lesson. Well, I jerk them. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, really, when I think about all the difficult people that, you know, that can come in your life there, they teach you how to be stronger and stand in your power. And really, I am grateful for that lesson because now um, nobody can mess with me. Like you can try to mess with me and I'm going to let you have it. I'm not going to be shy. I'm not going <laughs> to lay down, be a doormat. And, and I really thank that man for it. But I don't know why I went off on that tangent and told yes. that story. Well, it's a, it's a lesson. It in the, the other evaluation you're going to need as you go through some of these opportunities for yourself is they do have to align with your values. And you can find that out fairly easily um, by a conversations with them where you go, oh, I didn't know you were that person. Or um, by looking at their websites, understanding kind of who they are and what their position is. And if you're, if you're not aligned with that, then that's probably not a good situation for you. It's right. probably not a good situation. And I know people that are like, I, I don't work for those people. You're like, cool. You don't have to. You don't have to. So these days, well, for quite a few years now, I can honestly say like most of our clients, most of my clients I have, they become friends and I have their, we've developed friendships and it's so nice because um, I remember in the beginning when I was starting out, it wasn't so much that way. I think maybe I was, maybe, you know, I was attracting the wrong people into my life or whatever, but I had more difficult clients 20 years ago and now it's, different. Like I don't, and maybe because I'm good at sorting through things and I can spot a difficult client and I don't go into business with them. And maybe that's right. what it is. Um, oh, wait a minute, Mara, I'm Brazilian owned manufacturer company in Brazil. I had that experience myself. Okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, and you know what? I have to say <laughs> this. I, I kind of regret saying that. Gone he was a different Bra direction. <laughs> I, I regret saying he was Brazilian. I have so many Brazilian friends. One of my our, yeah, I have so I don't know why I'm surrounded by Brazilians here in San Clemente. So I mean I I have tons of friends from Brazil. It was just it just happened to be where this man was from and it and, you know, popped out and, of my and mouth. It is, but you know, I mean you can have that same situation from um you know, a guy in the United States that treats you like little lady, you know. So yeah. it doesn't it's not necessarily a cultural thing, but there is definitely a machismo <laughs> kind of idea in 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 places certain certain places, places. Yes. and then and then you so. get the older generation like the men you know over 70 tend to yeah. be a little because because now we like we've trained our boys you know like this younger generation growing up they they don't even think of they they totally see women as equal but you know generations behind us they weren't really taught that um, okay. So do you, how, how are you doing on time, Ronnie? Are you having fun? Do you have to be somewhere? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have so much, uh, so many great questions and I like, I know I'm kind of skipping around. Um, do you mind if I just like, this is a good question. I'd love to get your take on this, Ronnie. How do art collectors feel about artists licensing art? Um, well, I don't know all the collectors, so I don't know, but I, it, again, it has to be, if you have, uh, a, an enthusiastic, uh, collector group that pays you a bunch of money, you have to be very judicious on what you put your stuff on, because that is the quickest way to kill that collector group. And so maybe say you do beautiful paintings and then you end up with a license for a very expensive wine label. They would be like, oh, I have this wine and I have the painting. You know, that might be a cool thing. If you have a more, um, uh, how should I say, more of a middle of, of the road collection, um, collector population um, that isn't like super expensive or something, they might be thrilled. Yeah. to see your stuff on a water bottle or whatever because they were sort of in the know in the beginning it's so situational and it yeah. it really has to do with what you do what your relationship is with those collectors and sometimes depending on how close you are to the collectors you could say to them hey i got this opportunity to do this licensing deal what do you think of that they for one yeah. thing everyone loves to get to have someone ask their opinion and so sometimes you can have that conversation because again, we can do that now. We can do that now. We are intimately talking with our collectors, whereas we, it, there was always the barrier of the gallery system where you never spoke to a collector and that still happens. But if you can have that conversation, sometimes you can do that, but you have to be very, it's like a sharpen your pencil to make sure that you are doing the right kind of products that they will, um, you will not tick them off and you might delight them by they get to have something else with your stuff on it. Yeah. So our experience with Drew's art is, you know, we've been licensing his, his, licensing his art for over 20 years and his collectors are totally fine with it. I, be, because they, first of all, they're, they're not spending $50,000 on a painting. And even if they were, I think we've, train them enough to know they know that drew's art goes on products we have this one guy and he's coming here to the gallery he lives in arizona he's a collector he's bought like five paintings from drew he just commissioned his fifth painting coming to pick it up this weekend and he loves that drew licenses the art and drew has licensed a couple of his commission paintings for different products and it makes him so happy. And, um, well, and he's, he's kind of in the know, like I was the yeah. first, I was part of the collaboration. I was exactly. part of this thing. And so that, yeah. that can be great. It just depends. It depends. Yeah. Sorry. Carl. Everything, it, it all depends. <laughs> That's the answer to every question. <laughs> Jessica St. Clair is starting a new themed brand of clothing. Can an entire brand be licensed by a manufacturer? And yes, and I happen to know a lot about this because um, I am in the hub of the surf industry here in San Clemente, California. And that's how a lot of the surf companies, um, clothing companies start out. 
um, they start out producing their own clothing line and then they end up getting a giant licensee to take it even bigger to market. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. If yeah. you know, but I think you have to prove it first before you can get that or at least prove it a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, and that's the thing. I mean, there is the proof of concept. You know, you have this this collector base and so many brands that we know of started as sort of scrappy little independents. You know, you, you look at. Um, oh, why do names just escape when you're trying to <laughs> relay the story? The guy that started FUBU, Damon Johns. Started you know the FUBU guy. Fubu. That's his name, Damon Johns. I don't know what anyway, Fubu is. Um, it's well, it's a clothing line. <clears throat> okay. He started making polar fleece hats, like making them. He was like a 16-year-old kid, like making them and selling them on the street. Fubu stands for for us, by us. And so um he started to build this giant conglomerate of a thing by making felt or er, polar fleece hats. And so, I mean, th that is a, you know, an unusual situation, but, you know, then he licensed the FUBU name on shoes and on this and on that and all of that. But I mean, definitely things come from um, the fashion industry and a clothing line. It, it's, again, it's a bit of a long shot, but if you know your customer and if you are talking to your customers and you have a, a base of people that really like what you're doing, that tends to move the needle better for yeah. you. It's always about, um the audience you, yes. we always have to remember that in licensing because i hear this a lot and i did it myself i'm going to license my art and it's like well who cares <laughs> as far as I, like when i started doing my work like here's a bunch of snowmen and people did care about the snowmen and so um you you but you have to remember that you're delivering something for someone else it's not just you um licensing is is slightly different than creating art just for yourself or to create your own creative expression. It might become licensable, but more than likely you're thinking about who wants this? What is this theme I'm going after? Yeah. Who are these people I'm talking to? And that's how you get some traction around your work, especially in the sea of images that we have available to us now. That was a long answer, but the answer was <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it, there's so, I mean, all of this just goes so deep that we need to, we need like 50 hours to really answer all these questions. Yes, yes, um, totally. And and I think Maria and I could do 50 hours. <laughs> we <laughs> absolutely could. You Let know what we need me. to do? We need to, we need to go rent like a villa in Italy and just make sure there's good Wi-Fi there and just do this every day. There you go. That sounds fun. We should do that. All right. Um, okay. Mako Fufu, who I've known for a long time. Good to see you. This is a good question. Goes in another topic, but if you license to a small business or I would say any business, how do you know they are not printing more units than agreed or that they respect the time limit for selling the items? Well, you have a really good contract and you stay in communication with them. Hey, how's it going? So they know that you are just didn't disappear and they can do stuff like that. Now, again, sometimes you'll never know that. You'll, you'll just never know that. But the only way that you can is to be their best friend, to go, hey, yeah. you know, we talked about doing the 500 units, how many have you sold? And then, you know, most people are not going to lie to you, you know, and so, um, so I think that um, just staying in touch and being close, and, and if you're getting close to the end of that contract, start to have that conversation about, so how did it go? Do we want to renew anything? Blah, blah, blah. But eh, it's it's some of those things you just never know. And yeah. that is the hard part of this business. It's a, a bit of a leap of faith. Again, well, and we try to work with dirt balls. But. And, I, <laughs> and I like what you said, you know, I, I always say that too, like stay in contact with them. The squeaky wheel gets paid. And if you, so, and I think a lot of us get busy and I've been guilty of this where you kind of let things slide that like right now I have a licensee that their payments 30 days late and I got to send an email and I've been thinking about it for a week and I'm like, yeah, I really need to jump on it because 
if you let it go too long, they you you're training them totally. how to treat you. And if you totally. go silent, you're training them that you don't care. But if right. you stay on top of it, you're training them that you're paying attention. Right. I mean, right, right. on, especially if they're a small business, um, it's it's easy to talk to them. And you know, you can yeah. sort of put it into the, your rotation of activity. You can say, okay, this <clears throat> we know this launched on April 1st middle of may let's call them and go hey how's it going how and you know do we need to tweak anything how's it going and whatever so they know you are part of this process and they are far less likely to um, rip somebody off that is part of the process and is and feels like a collaborator for them yeah okay so here's a good question and before we answer it i want to just let everybody know that this question how to find out who to approach at the company <clears throat> to pitch we go through we're going to go through this in detail in Art Licensing 2 course. Sign up for the course or at least click the link and read about everything you're going to learn. Um, and uh, Ronnie, do you want to answer this question? Um, yeah, it's it's a big topic. It's a, <laughs> I know. So let's just give a little but, bit. And because I got to tell you, Eugenia, it's, it's the worst part of the whole deal. It's, it's the oh, hardest don't scare part. them away. I know. I don't want to scare you away, but it is. It's it's the challenge. It's the challenging part of the business is that um, it's a lot of research. It's a lot of turning over rocks. I, I do in the course have um, about eight different methods that I have employed over the years to start to find those things. Um, but really, it's a matter of just doing some research, using um, any or anything in your arsenal to, to move that needle to get closer to the person that makes a decision. Like LinkedIn is great. I remember a couple of years ago, I wanted to develop a relationship with the people at Dick Blick because we were, I had this idea of something I wanted to do and I needed to collaborate with them and I couldn't get an in to them. And, it, and then finally I thought, you know what, I'm going to, go on LinkedIn and LinkedIn is fabulous because you can look up a company and it'll often show you all the people that work there and what their title is. So I went to like one of the top guys, I forget his title, but he was up there and I just started sending him messages and he responded. And then we were emailing back and forth. The thing I was going to work on ended up not happening, but I have a relationship with this guy somewhat now, like we know each other. And um, really, that's one way to do it is LinkedIn. Um, another way is get an introduction, especially if it's like a local company. So that's something I just had happen. Um, there's a company called Mood Mats, and they make these really, they're, they're like these uh, neoprene mats that they sell in the cannabis industry. Um, but you, it doesn't even have to do with, I mean, you don't even need to like cannabis to like these mats. You can hang them on the wall. But what people do is they um, put them on tables and they put, they have like their glass bongs that they put on it. Yeah, this is a product that sells. I don't know. I never even, I never even heard of this product until recently. And I saw it and I was just like, oh my gosh, they do, they, they, they do like these cut out art. Thing. So it's perfect for Drew's art, but I didn't know the people there, but I knew a guy who knew the people there. So I called my friend and I said, hey, can you make an introduction? So if it's, you know, a smaller company, you might know somebody that knows somebody at the company and you can ask for an introduction and that's how you get to the That is right a tried people. and true method. I mean, we, yeah. we tend to ignore that method. It's, you know, we know that it's networking. And so, um, and, and that is sometimes hard if you don't live in a place where you're necessarily going to run into people that are local or whatever. But I've, I have introduced people to other people. There's ways yeah. to do that um, that supports all parties. Um, and so um, I, I, that, that is a really good way to do that. that. That's probably the best way because you're already vetted by the person that yes. introduced you. Um, exactly. But it's it's you know again it's it's very situational. But you know googling, um, looking at people's websites. Once you start to identify, you know it's it's sort of a I, I liken it to I was going to say peeling an onion, but it's more like eating an artichoke. 
It's like you pull out like the, the, the first parts of the artichoke are kind of, you know, kind of dry and you get a little bit of things to eat. And then as you get closer, closer, they get tastier. These little morsels start getting moister, more moist <laughs> until you get to the heart. And so it's kind of like that with this uh, whole process that you're like, OK, I've, I've, it's like a giant artichoke that you're OK. Here's the stuff on the edges, and then you're getting closer and closer and closer. So when you start to identify products, then you can start to identify manufacturers. And when you identify manufacturers, you can start to say, okay, how do I get in front of those people? Who are these people? And then because you don't have to, you don't have to look up 500 companies. You have to look up five companies or yeah. 10 companies before you start getting having conversations with people. But it's yeah. it's 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 a job. It's a job. Yeah, it is. It is work. I mean, you know, there's no magic bullet, but I'm going to say that that Mood Meds company, when I got that introduction and then, you know, and I, I asked my friend to introduce us through email so that I would have their email address. And then I and then that person responded. I responded back in one week. I had a license deal within one week. Wow. It was like it was like butter. It was so easy. Like butter. Yeah. Like butter. And yeah, and the products are going to be out in like a couple months. That I'm is really so cool. Excited. And that's the other thing about a local manufacturer or somebody that's making stuff like out back. Yeah. You can have stuff on the market really fast. fast. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I just like this. Heather Johnson said, art licensing summer camp? Maybe. Totally. Maybe. Totally. Um, we might just do that. Okay, let's see. Well, I always say that we, we ran out an entire cruise ship, but that was before COVID. Like, it just oh. the Arlington like cruise ship, all we do is lay around and talk to each other. <laughs> I have a great it's idea. A marvelous we rent, idea. We, we rent a castle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the heck with cruise ships. They're, they're full of germs. I've never wanted to go on a cruise ship anyway. I know that's weird, but. Well, only, um, if you, only if you know every single person on it. Okay, that, that that's would be when cool. you would do that it. That would be all yeah. right. That would just be a large yacht then. So whatever. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's see. Edie asked, wouldn't doing business only with companies that will provide professional references help cure any worries about the license or keeping up with their end of the bargain? Well, I suppose so. But, you know, you, you don't even need them to provide you with professional references. I always say if if you're doing something if you're doing something with a company that licenses art for many artists, call at least or contact at least three of those artists and say, hey, what is it like doing business with this company? Do they pay on time? Are they respectful of your art? Are you happy with with everything? Right. That is a good, you know, do your yeah. homework. And most most people are not going to you can you cannot ask, you just can't ask for a professional rec reference. I mean. They just would be like, yeah. They're like, yeah, hey, I'm not going to bother with that. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and it's Thanks, so easy no. to get information online. Yeah. yeah, and you know, and that's the thing. It's very easy to reach out to any of those artists. You know, some may yeah. respond and some don't. But right. yes, totally. So Brett Dewall, thank you for this question. When licensing with the company, does it matter if you if you are a? I think what Brett's asking is, does it matter if you have a professional business name versus just your name? Does not no. matter at all. No. no, makes no difference at all. No. In fact, it, it may make less difference. I mean, they want to work with artists. They want yeah. to work with artists. They're like so excited to have somebody that they go, we know Brett DeWall. He's our guy. You know, I mean, that would be the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Laura Wayne says, thank you. You're welcome, Hi, Laura. Laura. Debbie Barnett, most of the artists I know who are selling successfully have a spouse that does the selling. Oh, well, you know, I know. I, you know what? But, but the spouse still handy. has to get paid. I, so people always say that. They always say, oh, Drew's so lucky he has you. Yeah, but he has to pay me. Like, well, we have, we're 50-50 owners of the business. But, you know, if I wasn't doing it, he would have to hire somebody else to do it. So it's a business expense having somebody, you know. Right work for you. And it's probably cheaper to not have your spouse work for you. <laughs> yeah. And you know, uh, but there's a lot of people that don't. So I, I think that you, you know, there's just a lot of people that don't, I mean, and, and I, I worked with my husband, we worked together before we were husband and wife, and then we worked together to her husband and wife. 
And one of the advantages is you only have to get one hotel room. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, it was great because we spoke the same language and you get a shorthand and you don't have to explain everything all the time. Right. The, the downside is you, you, you have to turn off the faucet. You know, you have to say, I'm not talking about this after 10 o'clock at night or on Sunday night or whatever. But there are challenges to both sides of that. Definitely. Yeah. Depends, on the, depends on the spouse. Sometimes there's screaming and yelling. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I like to do this. Sorry. I can't hear you right now. <laughs> well, in my family, you scream and yell a lot. So I, like the family I grew up in. And so I, I try not to be like that in my adult life, but it, it still comes out. Sometimes. Our family goes with Huffy. We're just Huffy. <laughs> Huffing and puffing, just a lot of. <sighs> yes, a lot of sighing goes on. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, so, I'd like to go to San Miguel de Allende. That I know. Good. So see, I like how we're getting this these this idea. Like mm -hmm. we we might just like birth this. Yes. Art and if you, to, if you happen to have a castle, feel free to put it in the comments. We'll put you up on the screen. Yes, we will put you on the screen if you have a castle for us. Okay, let's see. Um, someone believing in you is priceless. That is true. And hey, if you don't have anybody in your life to believe in you, we believe in you. We are totally. here for you. Totally. Okay. Um, Debbie says, I wasn't pointing at you, Maria. Most of my family, female artist friends do all their own art marketing. We all complain. I, I get it, Debbie. And thank you for clarifying that. I didn't feel like you were. Um, I just hear that. A, I do hear that a lot. And I just do like to always point out, you know, uh, what I pointed out. Um, well, you know, here's the you. other thing on that, on that topic. Yeah. Eventually, if you want to move to the next level, you got to get help somewhere. Yes. Like maybe it's somebody that cleans your house. Maybe it's more yeah. childcare. Maybe it's an assistant. So somewhere, somewhere mm -hmm. you're going to have to get help if you want to get to that next place. Yeah, absolutely. Get it. You, you know, and, and now you can hire online virtual assistants, which I actually work with two different part-time online assistants. Um, and they can take a lot of load off of you. It's mm -hmm. it's it's work for you in the beginning, but once you get them going, they take a lot off. All right. Well, I think that pretty much wraps it up for the day. That was some great questions, you guys. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Um, and hey, I want to, I'm throwing the ticker in, join our art licensing course. Look at that little ticker I got at the bottom. Isn't this great? I learned how to do that. <laughs> We're so proud. So I'm so proud of myself. And I didn't even have my VA do it. I did it all by myself. Um, okay. And we will close this out. Ronnie, first of all, I want to say thank you so much. And I would love for anybody who's still on with us, give Ronnie a shout out because you know what? She is so generous with her time and her information. And I always learn so much from her. Um, so leave her some love in the comments. I would really appreciate it. I know she would too. And um, do you have any last parting words or um, Just, you know, just take it in small bites, one step at a time. You don't now have to know every single thing, every single nuance to get started. Just start. Just start. I love that. I love that. So much because I mean, you're not going to know everything, right? That's you're a great way to everything. end it. And we're getting a lot of love in the comments. So thank you all for your um, comments and your thanks. We really appreciate it. Makes us feel oh, that's good. That's really sweet, you guys. Thank yeah. you. That's I know. Fantastic. I like to bring it all up on the screen here. Um, okay. Well, that's it, everybody. I hope to see at least some of you in our course. Um, click the link in the description to find out more about it. And we'll do more of these in the future. All right. Totally. totally. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Thanks. everybody.